G'day, g'day, and welcome to Wicked Wildlife. Now, most weeks, when we're out at educational shows displaying Boo, our baby common wombat, a common question we get asked is, could I keep a wombat as a pet? And while I wouldn't recommend a wombat as a pet, it does raise an interesting question. Could we or should we be keeping native animals as pets? So stick around, guys, we're gonna tackle this question. Should we be keeping native animals? They're pretty dangerous. So straight off the bat, I'd like to point out that keeping native animals as pets is not exactly a new idea. In fact, out of an estimated 24 million pets being kept by Australians at the moment, 400,000 of them are reptiles which due to our strict import and export laws, are all native. So things like blue tongue lizards and turtles and all our pythons are all native animals being kept as pets. On top of that, there's a huge amount of native birds and native fish that are regularly being kept as pets with great success. The thing is, we often don't think of these when we have this debate of whether we should not be keeping native animals as pets. It seems to be only the mammals, only the cute fluffy stuff that really causes any debate at all but there's plenty of reasons that we could or should maybe look at keeping some of those as well. So one of the first concerns that a lot of people have when regarding this topic, particularly with our native marsupials, is that these guys require an awful lot of specialist care to look after. And while it's true that to hand raise animals, especially to hand raise them to a level where they can be released into the wild and stand a chance of survival, is certainly a specialist skill. That being said, there is a whole host of, I suppose, more traditional pets that still require some specialist skills and knowledge. Even things like tropical fish or marine fish, uh, ferrets, all sorts of things, require a lot more knowledge and different sets of knowledge than you would for a cat and a dog. So people are out there willing to spend the time and effort to get this knowledge. It's uh, not something that we want to see in the average pet store for somebody to pick up just on a whim though. But for somebody who wants to get the knowledge out there, it certainly is achievable to look after these guys well and look after them properly. Another major concern that a lot of people might share, and I was included in this for an awful long time, was that if people are able to keep native animals as pets, it's only a matter of time before we start breeding all these non-natural colours. Things like albinism in our carpet pythons, we've got different colour morphs in our marsupials already, and uh, there's hundreds of mutations in our bird life. And it's true that this means that these animals can't be released and it sort of shoots a hole in the idea that captive keeping provides a backup population in case one of these animals becomes endangered in the wild. A great example is something like the uh, Gouldian finch over in Western Australia is an endangered bird and there is millions and millions of them in captivity. However, in captivity they're bred to be all sorts of different colours which means that those animals aren't really suitable to release into the wild to help the wild Gouldian finches. With that being said, you might think that I don't believe there's any benefits in keeping native animals, and that's not true. There's actually a whole host of benefits for people keeping native Australian animals as pets, or animals native to your own country, wherever you're watching from. And they're some of the things that we want to talk about today. The last major point that opponents of the idea of keeping native animals as pets seem to raise is that by keeping native animals as pets and by legalizing these animals as pets, are we going to open the gate for all this poaching to begin? Animals being taken out of the wild and put into the captive trade. And I can't blame them. It's a pretty relevant concern. The sad reality is though, that this is already happening to a certain extent. Over in America, a rep Australian reptiles are in huge demand. In other parts of the world, our birds are in equally huge demand and they're being smuggled out every single day, which is absolutely tragic. These animals are almost always pulled out of the wild, they're smuggled in horrible conditions and they're sent overseas to who knows where. Now, while I'm not gonna open a debate on whether or not we should be importing or exporting animals, that's a whole different video. If it is going to happen, and the sad reality is happening already, I personally would much rather it be happening with captive born animals than animals taken out of the wild. When we start breeding things in captivity, their value seems to come down because they're more abundant, they're more able to be found. So they're more common, they're less valuable, and somebody's going to buy something, and if they're gonna smuggle it, they're going to smuggle that, rather than spending a week out in the bush looking to catch things. It's a pretty horrible thing that it's happening regardless, but it's really the lesser of two evils when we've got captive stocks that mean our wild stocks can be left alone. As far as here in Australia, 
are people going to be poaching stuff out of the bush to keep ourselves as pets? Luckily in Australia, all the states where you can keep native animals currently, it's very tightly controlled. Here in Victoria, if you have a sand goanna, like Priscilla here, uh, you have to have a license. Same as any other native animal. Same as in South Australia, other states where you can. And on that license, if you buy a lizard off me or off a local pet shop, you have to write down their license number. They have to write down your license number. And here in Victoria, once a year, I have to update Parks and Wildlife on all the animals that I've bought, that's passed away, all these sorts of things. So while it's not perfect, it is very tightly controlled to the extent where poaching for keeping in Australian collections is a fairly small issue. On top of that, it's not an all or nothing type of deal. Governments might say in one state you can keep this 30 species and that might not include endangered species that are at real risk of poaching affecting their wild populations. They're going to be more common species, ringtail possums, bearded dragons, blue tongue lizards, these sorts of things. So again, if the poaching is going to happen, which we hope it doesn't, it's not going to be endangered species. There is no state government, there is very few people saying we should be allowed to keep lead beaters possums and mountain pygmy possums and Tasmanian devils. You know, there, there is all sorts of wildlife going from that very advanced stuff that zoological institutions and even private people with the equivalent skills and experience and facilities might be interested in keeping. But everything down to things like hopping mice and some of our reptiles and our budgerigars and cockatiels who are already commonly kept as pets with huge amounts of success. So the first big advantage that we might get from letting people keep more native animals as pets is we gain a heap of knowledge when certain animals are available in the private sector. All you have to do is look at the reptile community and the bird community. Much of the skills and the husbandry practices that zoos around the world today use and implement when they're caring for both birds and reptiles were actually discovered and sort of fostered by private reptile and bird keepers. Now zoos obviously spend a lot of time looking into care and requirements and husbandry and all these sorts of things. But the fact is the sheer number of people who privately keep these animals far outweighs the resources that wildlife parks might have. On top of that, private people, I suppose, have the freedom to experiment with their husbandry and come up with all sorts of novel techniques which have in turn been used in zoological institutions. Now, while most of these things that private people have learnt have been with, I suppose, the more common species in captivity, the skills and the husbandry practices and all these sorts of things are transferable to some of the more endangered animals. So, allowing certain native animals to be kept as pets helps increase the amount of people researching and looking into how we can care for these animals better, which might just lead to better care for endangered species in captivity as well. A second major benefit that I think a lot of people really don't think about is that by keeping native animals as pets, we make it more financially viable for vets to spend more time training themselves and educating themselves in how to care for native Australian species. If you speak to any wildlife carer, most of them will tell you that it's really hard to find a vet who really knows their stuff with wildlife. If you speak to any vet, they'll tell you that it's really hard to get the good training. They only spend a few days in their entire uni degrees learning about how to look after native Australian animals. The people who do really well with this are people who have actually gone on after they become vets and take on specialist training. It takes a fair bit of commitment and often it's a fairly big financial strain. The issue is there's not a great deal of money to be involved with it. Vets try to do this work for wildlife carers at a cheaper rate than they might do for cats and dogs, for instance, and there's not as many of them as there is with your regular companion animals. The flip side is, when more people start keeping native animals as pets, suddenly vets have paying customers coming in, making it practical and, and a good idea for vets to go out and learn how to care for these animals. A great example of this is the reptile and bird communities. 20 or 30 years ago, it would have been almost impossible to find a vet who could treat something like a large python or have any idea about care of a crocodile or even turtles and lizards for that matter. Today, more and more people have started keeping these reptiles and birds as pets and it means that there's actually vets out there today who specialise in these animals. Now while it's great for the people keeping them as pets, all this knowledge that vets have accrued also goes a long way to helping when somebody comes in with actual wild-born animals that need care to be helped to re rehabilitate into the wild and be let go one day. So the more people keeping certain native animals as pets, the more vets are going to spend time learning and putting in the time to get the skills needed to help native animals. Another major benefit of keeping native animals as pets that I think a lot of people don't think of 
is that it builds a natural empathy between the general public and native species. A good example is Boo here. Every person who meets Boo, thousands of people a year, have that positive experience and develop a slightly better emotional connection with wombats. Hopefully, I mean, some of those people are more likely to, if they see a wombat hit on the side of the road, uh, to stop and, and check mum's pouch and, and see if there's a baby that needs help, which is exact, exactly how Boo came to live with us. Now, while everybody shouldn't be keeping wombats, these are what we'd probably consider a more advanced species. Imagine if, ever, if more people were keeping ringtail possums. How many more people are going to be more tolerant of having possums around their houses and their properties, maybe more likely to call the wildlife care if they notice some help? A good example is if you compare this to dogs. You might never own a dog in your life, but culturally, we're brought up around dogs. So even if you're not a dog person per se, if you see a dog hit on the side of the road or you see a dog on social media who's needing a home, it tugs at our heartstrings. And by bringing wildlife into our regular everyday lives, we start to build this emotional empathy, this emotional connection with some native animals that might not ordinarily tug at our heartstrings the same way a cat or a dog does. Now this emotional connection is a great thing. People helping animals on a small scale when they're able to. But you never know where this is going to lead. Even Steve Irwin, the legend that he was, got to where he was because of his father, Bob Irwin, who one day found a tiger snake and decided to start keeping reptiles, keeping native animals and caring for native animals. It expanded into Queensland Reptile Park, which then with Steve evolved into Australia Zoo and all the people who learnt and were inspired by him started because his father, a man living in Melbourne, was able to keep some native animals at home and bring a little piece of nature into their house and raise their kids around this and start this, this empathy and this love of wildlife at home. So a natural empathy for wildlife, whether it's stopping and checking an injured animal on the road or ringing a wildlife care, or one day getting a career in the field of zoology or biology or making a difference with these animals is a great thing. And it's something that I think a lot of people don't really think about as a positive with keeping native animals as pets. So with everything we've talked about today, personally, do I think that we should be replacing cats and dogs and keeping crocodiles and koalas in our backyards? Not really. I think these animals make great pets in the right situations, and I think people, if they're able to get the skills and experience and facilities put together to look after these animals, they should be allowed to, because there's all these benefits that we've already talked about. I do think that we need to be really cautious about saying that certain animals are good replacements for others, that quals could replace cats, or dingoes could replace dogs, or crocodiles could replace anything else. The reason being, is if you want an animal that's going to get your slippers and bring them to you in the mornings, you're gonna be disappointed with anything other than a dog. So whatever you get, it might be a brilliant animal, but it's not the pet you're after. So that being said, if you're after something different and you're willing to put the time and experience in, there is a whole host of our native species that could make really interesting options that are fairly straightforward to keep with the right experience, the right research into their care requirements, and luckily, there's plenty of ways you can get this. If you are interested in keeping native wildlife as pets, most states where this is allowed have herpetological societies, such as the Victorian Herpetological Society down here in Victoria. There's also marsupial societies and avicultural societies for birds, which are groups of really experienced people who can give you all their knowledge that they've gained over decades and decades. This is far better, in my opinion, than the social media groups that we have today, where you don't know if you're getting advice from somebody who's bred these animals for 50 years, or somebody who's read a book or watched it on an, another YouTube video or something. So there's all these good committees and groups where you can get some really good information. Anyway, guys, as you can see, personally, I think native animals could make great pets, even if I don't necessarily recommend them to replace cats and dogs. I think they're amazing in their own right, and we should appreciate them as something different not as being a cat or a dog or a rabbit, but for something as amazing as they are. If you'd like to know more about keeping native animals as pets and maybe hear another side of some of the pros and cons, I'd recommend checking out a podcast from some of our friends, Adrian and Steve over at the Aussie Wildlife Show, who have a recent episode on should we be keeping native animals as pets as well. So maybe go and have a talk to them or listen to them online. And uh, on top of that, I hope you enjoyed our video. If you haven't already, please subscribe to our YouTube channel or like us on Facebook. And if you want to become involved and help our videos come out more regularly, support us on Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Wicked Wildlife, where you can contribute to us bringing out these videos as regularly as we can and uh, bring out more knowledge and share our love of wildlife with the world. 
Other than that, guys, as always, thanks for listening. If you want to know anything else, please leave us a comment down below and we'll try and answer all your questions. But thanks for watching, guys. Be nice to wildlife. Have a good one and take care.